All right, all right. Well, well, good morning. Um, I cannot explain that strange voice that said roll tide over the loudspeaker. I'm considering keeping Chuck. I don't know. We might have to let him go. We'll see. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. <laughs> anyway, Chuck, come on, man. Come on. At least we know this. I'm an LSU graduate. A lot of you guys are Arkansas fans, but we have a common enemy at least, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, so. All right. Hey, y'all, check it out. I'm, we're going to get into the lesson today. We're going to get into uh, the book of Matthew again. We've been studying that throughout the summer. But I want to say this, look, all across the state right now, uh, all of our churches, all of New Life Church, we are very grateful, extremely thankful for the recent ruling that the Supreme Court made in regards to Roe versus Wade. We're extremely excited about that. We also know, we also know that now it's time to serve, to really, I'm talking about digging in and working and going to, going to work as the body of Christ when it comes to foster care and all of the needs around adoptions. And uh, I'm also very thankful that we started CityServe, and now that's all over the, over the state as well, uh, not just with New Life, but other churches as well, where we, we can continue to meet needs, okay? And, uh, and, and listen, we are ready to be the body of Christ, amen? We are ready. So can, can you join me in prayer about this right now? Would you bow your heads? First of all, we just thank you, Jesus. God, we are so grateful for the courageous and the just decision that was made in our land this week. We are humbled. We are grateful. And as your people, I ask that you would help us to demonstrate true mercy and true compassion in these coming days as we care for, as we protect, as we support the lives of moms and children and families. God, would you empower us to be your hands and feet? That's what we want. We pray that our church, but not just our church, the church, as a whole in our nation, would step up in many ways. God, allow us to become the answer needed for adoptions and foster care, as is your plan, God. And may we come alongside women that are making tough choices, Lord. Help us to do that and offer needed emotional, economic, and spiritual support, any kind of support they need in this time or their time of difficulty. And we believe this, that you're asking us as a church to rally around moms, not just when they're expecting a child, but long after their little one is born, help us to equip and activate dads and moms and the whole family to bring a change to our nation that is honoring to you. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Yeah, you can give the Lord a hand. Uh, listen, there's ways you can be involved in this, certainly by tithing and giving. Look, that always helps because that, that helps us meet needs. But there's other ways, and in fact, if you want to visit uh, with our Welcome Center out in the foyer, uh, we have some information specifically how you can personally get involved in ministry aimed at foster care and at adoption support, okay? So check that out if you're interested in that, and uh, we would love for you to do that. All right, Matthew, how many of y'all ready for the Word of God? Say, I'm ready. Hey. Say, I'm more ready than the last service. <laughs> okay, good. All right, so um, it isn't a competition but it kind of is, all right? So your readiness level will be judged, okay? So uh, today, I want you to turn to chapter, <laughs> so bad, chapter nine of Matthew, and uh, we're gonna look at a story. I'll give you a little backstory on the story, but today we're gonna look at the time when Jesus went to uh, a dinner at Matthew's house. Now listen, who wrote the book of Matthew? I can see you are studied scholars. <laughs> yes, uh, but yeah, that's right. Clearly, we've explained this to you. Uh, so yeah, he was the author of this book, but I think it's so cool that we get to see this glimpse into Matthew, his life before he was a disciple, and then when he was a disciple, and this, this house party, okay, was so key in the middle of it all, and the kind of dinner this was, imagine this, imagine a dinner at your house with the most eclectic, I mean the most varied types of people you can imagine there. So, so, so imagine that you have a party, a dinner at your house, and okay, you have your church family there, you got some of them there, yep. You got your, your coworkers, like your colleagues, they're there. Then you got your old college drinking buddies, they're there as well in the mix. And let's just throw in your in-laws just for funsies, all right? I mean, this is, this is the party that is happening in this story we're about to read. It is awkward. I mean, this is so so many different kinds of people, 
But here's the thing. It's a story about Jesus giving people second chances. How many of y'all appreciate that about Jesus? Yeah, some of y'all should be way more happy about that, okay? Maybe you didn't amen because you're on your 17th chance. I don't know. But this story also shows us something big about the heart of God as well. His heart, okay? And so why are these stories in the Bible? Why are they important to me and to you? In other words, what do they mean to us? Well, I think this. It's more than just you knowing what Jesus did. It's for you to know what Jesus does, okay? It's more than just you knowing who Jesus was, because who he was is who he is now and who he will ever be always. Amen? And so we're going to dig into this. Let's look at this. It's Matthew 9, verses 9 through 13. I'm going to read this. We'll look at it. We'll break it down. Just see some things we can learn, okay? And uh, it says, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth, because that's what Matthew did for a living. Now, I think it's kind of weird the way Matthew wrote this, and I'm going to get into that uh, in a moment. But follow me, Jesus told him that. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means, and he quotes the Old Testament. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. Can we pray again? Lord, would you open up all of our hearts, our minds, our eyes, our ears to see and hear and to know and to experience marvelous things out of your word, God, today. We want to change, and we need you to do it for us. So, Lord, just like your word says, it never returns to you empty without accomplishing the purpose for which it was sent. God, would you do that for us today as we're learning your word together? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, a couple things here. First thing you need to know, first thing I think we need to note is that you must get up and follow. This is a good lesson. We're talking about following Jesus, okay? Y'all are with me? And you see this in this story. This is what Matthew did. Get up and follow Jesus. There's some action involved. There's some change involved. It's really cool. So in verse 9, we already read it, but it says, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at that tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. I think this is a great visual of being a disciple of Christ. It's a a visual picture of it, right? In fact, I prefer calling people Christ followers over Christian. I haven't used the term Christian for years because I believe Christ follower gives a a better mental image of what we're to be like in our lives, all right? And so uh, any of y'all have any pets or maybe a dog likes to follow you around? Anybody? Man, my dog Molly... (laughs) She loves to follow me, okay? Truth be known, she would probably follow anybody, but she's with me a lot, and she follows me. I mean, she has to be with me. You ever had a dog? like Somebody said, every minute, yes, yes. It's amazing. It's a dog thing, I guess. And so here's the thing I know. Like, if I, if I lose sight of her, it's because she's right behind me. She's at my feet, okay? <laughs> so somewhat of a tripping hazard. And, uh, but I think this is a great picture of how we should be with Jesus, right? Right up at his feet, right up, all, right behind him. Okay, you're, you're moving, I'm moving too. Oh, you're doing this, I'm going to do it with you. You know, this, this is the way we should be. And, and, and the way that Matthew tells this story, I mentioned it, it, it earlier that it, it sounds kind of weird the way he says it. Like he is, uh, first of all, he's writing in the third person, which I think is weird, you know, like Michael Jordan did for a little while. But uh, Three of you got that. Great. Uh, Matthew is writing about the single most important miraculous event in his life. The day Jesus comes on the scene in his life. And so you would think he would write it like this. And then I saw Jesus and he was coming my way or something like that. Right. But no, no. Instead, and he gets it right. He says, Jesus saw a man named Matthew. And the reason he got it right is because Jesus saw us first. 
Do y'all recognize that? Jesus saw us first. He saw us exactly where we were in life, okay? And before I ever saw him, before I was even looking for him, he was looking for me. And the Bible confirms that, all right? I was on his radar way before he was ever on mine. And uh, here's the thing I want you to understand with this point is when you recognize that fact, like this is what's happening with Matthew. When you recognize that Jesus is looking at you like he is there for you, he sees you. Can I just tell you, there's no, there's no experience like that in the world. Like there's not even a second close, like nothing comes close to it. It's like Jesus is walking into my life today. He's looking at me, okay? And, and, and when Jesus does this for, for Matthew, notice what Jesus says. How does he say it? Does he say this? Hey, bro, you got to clean yourself up, man. And he could have, because you may know some things about tax collectors in that t- at that time. They were the scum of the earth. Their people didn't like them because they were, they were traitors, really. They, they sold out. They were collecting taxes for, for the Roman army that was occupying. <laughs> Think about that. That's, that's rough to take, isn't it? So they weren't really liked by the Jews, I can tell you that. But also, even the Romans, they were of such low character, these, these tax collectors. Did you know that tax collectors weren't allowed to bear witness or be a testimony in a Roman court because of their reputation? Man, let me just say this. Jesus would have been justified saying, clean yourself up, okay? But what did he say instead? What did he say? Follow me. And amazingly, Matthew gets up and he follows him. Now, right here, I want to contrast Matthew with some other guys in the Bible. In in fact, in Luke 9, you see this in other places as well. But contrast Matthew with these guys. And listen, Jesus sounds so mean in this next next encounter. But Luke 9, 59 through 62, he said to another man, follow me. But he, this man, replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. Y'all couldn't have handled that answer. I can promise you that. (laughs) No way, dude. Oh, man, you'd be posting stuff on Facebook about Jesus. Look, let the dead, you know what he told me. Uh, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. (laughs) It's it's incredible to me. Uh, Verse 61, still another said, I'll follow you, Lord. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Sounds reasonable. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Get you some of that, Jesus. (laughs) Check this out. I want to show you something here because I want you to watch this. And it does sound mean, but we... Look, we all do this at times in our lives, but notice that Matthew didn't do what I'm about to show you, point out in this conversation on the screen here, all right? He didn't do it, and in fact, it's what makes you a disciple or not a disciple, and it's this little phrase in there, look at it, Lord, but first let me. Lord, hey, Lord, but first let me go and be Lord of my own life in this area, in my family. Let me be Lord for a second over here in my business, in my personal beliefs, in, the, in my opinion. Come on, somebody. Am I right? In my grief, right? One guy was grieving. Let me be Lord in my grief. Listen, somebody said, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And this is exactly why, this is it. This is exa- it's an oxymoron. You can't have it like this. That's why Jesus said that many are going to say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, and they're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? He said, only those who did the will of my Father. There's no stipulations on this thing. I'm just preaching to the church right now. I love Matthew. He's a great example for us. Man, I, 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 don't, I don't get it right like he does all the time, but this guy nailed it. He gets up and he follows Jesus. He literally abandoned his job and and his livelihood, his lifestyle. That was a big deal for a tax collector. He got rich off of that. Not only that, I I guess the Romans might not take too kindly to him just leaving his booth, just saying. I imagine there was no going back for that brother. I think about Peter, James, and John, Andrew as well. He's the forgotten disciple. And they left their nets. Y'all remember this? They left their nets to follow Jesus. But I kind of think they could... They could have always, if it didn't work out, they can go back to the family business. They can go back to fishing. In fact, uh, a few of them actually did briefly. 
But not this brother, not Matthew. It's like he was burning bridges, okay? And here's why I'm telling you this. The greatest days in your life come when you abandon some things that you shouldn't be involved in. Well, look, when you leave something to follow Christ, that is the best day of your life. And sometimes it's a process, that's right. You know, you, the Holy Spirit will reveal things and you're, okay, yes, sir, okay, yes, sir, I'm leaving that. Are y'all still here? I'll tell you this, if you are a follower of Christ, you should be able to point to some things you left behind. Nope, that changed that, that not, that's gone. And I'm talking about over time, you will see this, amen? That's the cost of being a disciple. Jesus is the teacher. This is so important for you to understand this, guys. He's the teacher. I'm the learner. All right? And the cool thing is, in this process of following him, we get changed on the inside. We, be, we become transformed, and it's really exciting. Okay. All right, second thing. We know we're going to get up and follow, but what else can we learn from this? Well, what should, what should you take with you? In other words, you're going into this new life. Many of you are in this new life with Christ. What should you take with you? Well, let's look at Matthew. Look at verse 10. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, I already talked about that, many tax collectors, that's his work buddies, and sinners, that's his partying bros, okay, they came and ate with him and his disciples. So we can see that Matthew brought a couple of things from his old life, when he followed Jesus. So what are those things? A few things I see. Well, first of all, he brought his pen with him. (laughs) Thank God, right? Because Matthew is one of the most read books in the Bible. But you know what that represented? That was a skill in his life. God wants you to use your skills and your talents for the kingdom. Okay? And what else, though? He also took his influence. Now, I want you to think about this. This is big because this guy throws a party for all his friends who do not know Jesus. And, uh, and Jesus is there. These people are sinners. The Bible describes them as that, which literally meant people uninterested in the law. And so I don't want you to miss this. This is a big point for the day. Please pay attention. What's Matthew doing? Matthew is partnering his worldly influence, okay, with the presence of Jesus, and he gets them together. Matthew's doing this. That's powerful. That's God's will for your life. Amen? In fact, I'll tell you about this church. 18 campuses around the state has been built by many of you, many people using their worldly influence for the kingdom of God to bring people to Christ. Can you see it? Can you see that? I can too. It's so clear. It's just like what Matthew did. And uh, back in the day, in the early days of the church, we used to tell people this. We'd make the statement, a deal, like Monty Hall up here. Let's make a deal. Gosh, that's old. Oh, my Lord. I was like five years old when that quit running. But anyway, just to redeem myself a little bit. Listen, we, we, would, we would make deals with people. we say, as pastors around here, here's the deal. If you do what we cannot do, we'll do what you cannot do, and we're going to get this thing done. And what do we mean by that? If you, listen, if you use your influence, like, see, God has put you in a realm of influence. We can't, that's not my world. But if you will use the influence in your world, which I cannot have, God has gifted you with it, then here's what we're going to do. We, as pastors, we're going to provide an environment here that is bathed in prayer, that is full of worship of the Most High God, putting Him where He belongs in our lives, and the Word of God, the truth being spoken. And I'm telling you, here's what's going to happen. If we do this together, together we're going to see many people come to Christ and make Him Savior and Lord. And not only that, we're going to together help them develop as disciples of His. Amen? So exciting. This is exactly what Matthew is modeling here in this party. So who do you invite to this party? Like, this is a party. Who do you invite? I suggest hungry people. Anybody ever cook for somebody and like, you're through a party? It's, it's a real drag when you prepare, prepare dinner and people are like, eh, I ain't hungry. And all the moms are like, I know, I want to slap someone. 
Kamani was in the first service. She's just rolling her eyes at me because she can tell you what it feels like. It's happened more than once where she'll spend all this energy making this dinner and all the kids come in and we're gathering. Oh, we already ate dinner. <laughs> we already ate. And you know what? That's at that time, she looks at us and says, get out. You know, so, so, so here's what I'm asking you to do. Have your antennas up all the time. Looking for hungry people. I'm talking about people who are hungry for change in their life. People who are like, they, they know they need a miracle. Like they don't know what they need, but they know they need something. You get your antennas up for those people and get them here. Amen? That's what Matthew did. So what, what else? Another one. Write this one down. This is so important because it goes exactly with what I was talking about. I'm the one who's sick. This is a great attitude to adopt. We have to understand this. Hey, I'm the one who is sick. And going back through our passage here, I'm going to skip over verse 10. We've talked about that. But at verse 11, when the Pharisees, see, they're there too, right? These are the religious leaders, the religious elites. When they saw this, all these sinners and tax collectors, they asked Jesus' disciples, why does your your teacher eat with them? I mean, this is ridiculous. On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. And this is actually Hosea 6, 6 that he quotes. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. God said that. And Jesus says, for for I have come, or I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay, before we dive too much into this, can I just... Can we just appreciate Jesus reclining at the table with sinful people? <laughs> Isn't it beautiful? And he ain't freaking out and he's not nervous. You know, sometimes I'm around people like, okay, how much do I say? How much do I don't say? Look, here's the thing. Jesus has no problem with this. He's not standing in judgment or anything like that. He's just relaxed and at ease. He amazes me. Jesus has this ability to, 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 to be comfortable around the unholy without sacrificing his holiness at all. At all. Don't you want to be like that? That is a target right there. We are called to be like our teacher. Amen? And it's interesting to me as well that the ones that are at this party that should be rejoicing, like the religious elites, right, should be rejoicing, they're actually criticizing. And the ones that should, be, should have been offended... <laughs> the sinners, they're actually rejoicing. They're having a good time. How many of y'all remember this? Back in uh, the early days of COVID, there was like this hyper awareness of illness of any kind, right? So you're in public, you'd cough, you'd sneeze or whatever. You felt like you almost needed to publicly explain yourself, you know, like, oh, and you'd make up some, oh, these allergies, you know what I'm saying? And just, oh, you know, you've never had allergies before, but you're like, oh, okay, because you want to be publicly ostracized and you have to take your temperature to, to, to submit to people. I like, see, I'm okay. <laughs> anyway, thank God we're past that. But, 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 but I'm just telling you right now, Pete, Listen, people who see Jesus move in their life, Jesus moves in the lives of people who admit, I'm not okay. I'm not okay. I'm sick. I need a healer. I need someone to help me. I need Jesus. That's the people who see Jesus move. In fact, we were talking about being sick and how Jesus said this. You know, it's incredible. I was thinking about this, how uh, my... uh, my back started hurting recently. I did something to it. Every once in a while, this will happen. Some of you can relate. And so uh, I, I was taking some Advil, and then it hit me that, you know, Advil, like painkillers, right? You know, they don't heal your hurt. They don't heal your issue. They hide your issue. Can I look at some Christ followers right now and say this? Maybe you're not a Christ follower. Some of you are medicating yourselves. You know that drink you're taking? that relationship you're in, even some of the religious stuff you're doing, you're medicating yourself and you're not healing the pain. You're hiding it. And God wants to get in there and heal it, but he can't. You're hiding it. Here's what he wants you to do. Stop medicating. Bring the thing out to Jesus and say, I'm the one. I need you. Just, just do that. But look, look at this conversation. Think about this conversation at this dinner table. In today's world, this would be such offensive language. Think about it. I laugh when I think about it. In their hearing, he's calling people sick, sinners. 
I mean, if I was at that table, I'd drop my chicken leg and say, hold on now, wait a minute here. All right, hold on. What, what did you call me? But see, that's not how they were. Like, I mean, that doesn't sound like love. Or does it? You see, you don't, listen, listen, you don't need, you don't need Jesus to affirm you in your sin. Like, you got a lot of other good qualities. You're, you're pretty good. <laughs> you don't need Jesus to do that. And you don't, you certainly don't need him to minimize your sin. Like, oh, the world's got so much bigger problems. Your little sins, that little something, that little nothing, nothing, ain't nothing. You know what you need? You, you need Jesus to look at you and to say, I came for the sick and I came for the sinner. And brother, I'm here for you. You need me. You're the one I'm here for. That's what you need to hear. You know, you, uh, you're like me. You probably always, you hear about these stories, people who, who are really ill or they get sick or injured or whatever. And, and, and if they hadn't recognized it, how serious it was, and they didn't get some help, they, they wouldn't have made it. Uh, just this week, one of our members, her dad, had some crazy symptoms going on. It ended up being a severe lack of potassium, but the doctors told him, had you waited 30 minutes to come in and get some help, it would have been a lot worse. Listen, this is how it is with us and Jesus. When you turn to Jesus and you tell him, I'm the one that's sick, it's me. I need a healer. I need a rescue, man. I need a rescue. Here's what happens when you do this, okay? When you do that with Jesus, all of a sudden, his supernatural desire for you and your life gets released into your life. And you know what it is? It's this word. It's a Hebrew word called hesed. And you can see it in the word of God. And it means mercy. But it's way more than that. It means his unconditional, undying mercy, his loving kindness toward you personally, your life. How many of y'all need some of that? This is it. And, and, and here's where you see it. Psalm 23. It's a very famous passage. By the way, Psalm 23. I've been meditating on this every morning for probably close to two months now. If you, if you need a script, scripture to meditate on, I highly recommend it. I might teach on this next week. But in it, here's what we see, right? David says, the Lord is my what? The Lord is my shepherd. It's very interesting because there's a lot of following involved in that. See, when you begin to follow Christ and you continue your life that way, just like Matthew did, the Lord becomes your shepherd. But here's what's cool. When you follow Jesus in that way, he turns around and commands some other things to follow you. Go to the verse 6 of this same passage. It says what? Surely goodness and mercy, that's our word, has said. His loving kindness, his love, his unconditional love is going to follow me all the days of my life. And what? And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Man, how good is that? So when you follow him, he's going to have his loving kindness following you the rest of your life right up until you get to heaven. He's going to, it's going to follow you right to heaven. Is that a good thought? I want you to bow your heads right now. I want to pray for you. I'm going to pray for our church, but uh, I also want to pray for people who may be far from God and you want to, you know, you know the Lord is calling you calling you to himself. But first, let me pray for our church. God, would you help us in this? We, we want to be like Matthew all the time. We, we don't want to be way behind you. We don't want to be way out in front of you. Just like your word says, that we should be in step with your Holy Spirit. Would you help us? God, would you also help us to love others who are nothing like ourselves and that we could be like Jesus in, in, in that arena? Help us to use our worldly influence like Matthew did and to bring people to the presence of Jesus as simple as just inviting them to church. Please help us in this area. You might be here though and you would say, I'm far from God. I, I don't really have Jesus as the Lord of my life. But maybe today you feel that you, the Holy Spirit is, is drawing you, much like Jason talked about this earlier. He's drawing you to Jesus. Can I tell you, please don't ignore that. You don't know how long that's going to last. 
you don't just get saved any old day you want to. I mean, this is, this is, this is the Holy Spirit's work. It's, it's his first work in your life. Don't reject him. But maybe you're here and you, you know the Lord, but you've somehow gotten off track. You, you're not as committed like Matthew was in this story to following Christ in every area of your life. Maybe there's an area you need to lay down today. You're like, hey, this area is not demonstrating the Lordship of Christ. I, I'm going to change that today. If that's you, any of those things, I, w- I want to know who we're going to pray for here. You, you need the Lord in your life. You need to recommit your life. Or there's just an area that you need his Lordship in. And you're going to establish that today. No looking back. I'm not going to point you out, but would you raise your hand all around this room toward heaven? Come on, lift it up high toward heaven. I just want to see who I'm praying for. You guys can put your hands down. Father, I pray for them as well, Lord. Would you help them? Holy Spirit, would you help them right now? And all around this this room, if that was you, just pray something where the Lord can hear you. Lord, I... I believe that you died for my sins and I'm counting on you to make me right with God. Just tell him that. That's a a statement of faith. Lord, I believe that you got out of the grave so I could have a life, a new life with you. Every day I want to follow you. Help me in that. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and also plug me into your body, the church, so that I can do that the rest of my life. That's what I want to be like, and I thank you for helping me. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen.